Our scripture reading today comes from Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 6. Hear now the word of God. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abraham had lived ten years in the land of Cana, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. And Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When we left Abraham two weeks ago, he was celebrating a great victory over four kings from Mesopotamia who had invaded the Jordan River Valley. They had taken some captives. Among those captives, Abraham's nephew, Lot. In a daring nighttime raid, Abraham freed the captives. He was finally living up to his calling to be a blessing. Following this triumphant moment, God appeared to Abraham in a vision and renewed his covenant with Abraham. You can read this in Genesis chapter 15. God said to Abram, Abraham, fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abraham responded by mentioning to God the obvious problem and the main source of frustration in his life. Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. God had promised to make Abraham a great nation, but Abraham had no children. To become a great nation, he would need at least one. When God had called him and said, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, Abraham had responded with faith. He had obeyed God. But now many years had passed. And Abraham asked God, what could you possibly give me that would make any difference as long as I don't have a child? Now, Abraham was the leader. He was the sort of father to an extended group of people. It would include Abraham and his wife, Sarah, their servants, and also all their hired help. It would be a decent-sized group of people that, that traveled around and cared for the flocks and so on. And once Abraham died, this group of people would need a leader. At that moment, the designated leader was Eliezer of Damascus. So would God fulfill his promise to Abraham through the adoption of this grown man? No. God said to Abraham, this man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. Look toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. So shall your offspring be. Scripture says that Abraham believed God's promise and God counted it to him as righteousness. Here we see justification by faith. 
Abraham was not innately righteous. He had moments when he honored God, but he had moments when he didn't as well. But when God spoke his word of promise to Abraham, Abraham believed God's word. He trusted the promise enough to obey. And God counted that as righteousness. So Abraham was saved by grace through faith, just as we are. But the important thing for us at this moment is that God had promised Abraham a son. And Abraham believed the promise. That evening, God gave Abraham another vision, a vision of a covenant ratification ceremony. In that time and place, when kings made a covenant with each other, Often they would cut an animal in half and they would walk through the half and they would swear an oath and say, may God do this to me if I do not keep our agreement. God had nothing greater than himself to swear by. But by giving Abraham this vision of a covenant ratification ceremony, God ratified his covenant with Abraham and sealed his promises to him. And now we're ready to move into chapter 16 and our scripture reading today. God had signed and sealed a promise to give Abraham a son. And yet Abraham and Sarah continued childless. They were childless when we met them back in chapter 12, and nothing has changed except God's promise. Sarah has passed menopause, and so her childbearing days, she thinks, are in the past. And she sees that God has a problem, or she thinks God has a problem and needs some help. And Sarah, she's just the person to give it to him. So Sarah says to Abraham, look, God has promised you a son. Clearly, you're not going to get one from me. So here's what we can do. Take my servant, Hagar, and perhaps you can have a son through her. And in this way, I can give you a son. From one perspective, this idea is not as crazy as it sounds. This kind of arrangement was not uncommon in that time and place. When a woman of means was unable to have children, she might take a servant and use her as a surrogate, and the child that resulted would be considered a legitimate heir. Uh, there were laws about this in Hammurabi's law code. This kind of arrangement is mentioned in some Assyrian marriage contracts. And if you know the book of Genesis, you remember that Abraham's grandson Jacob had children this way. So it was a standard practice in that time and place. Now we'll leave aside the morality of this, what choice Hagar had in the matter. The, the Bible often reports practices and customs that it does not endorse. In that time and place, people did this sort of thing. This is just a historical fact. And so the Bible reports it as such. Now, you might see some potential problems with this kind of arrangement. And in fact, the people of that time and place were well aware of those potential problems. There was a law that said if a servant who becomes a surrogate becomes arrogant toward her barren mistress, she should have her mouth washed out with salt. Those people in the ancient world were practical, if not humane. But the point is, they saw the problems that could happen. 
And of course, problems happened. <laughs> so in no time, Abraham got Hagar pregnant. Predictably, Hagar looked with contempt on Sarah. And predictably, Sarah didn't like it. It had seemed like a good idea at the time, but now Sarah was feeling like a third wheel. No one here acts well. Hagar looks with contempt on Sarah. Abraham fails to act responsibly. He shows no backbone and simply leaves Hagar to Sarah's wrath. And Sarah mistreats Hagar. So none of them act well. In fact, the Hebrew here in this passage echoes the earlier passage in Genesis where Adam and Eve disobey God and eat the fruit. It says that Sarah took Hagar and gave her to Abraham, just as Eve took the fruit and gave it to Adam. In Hebrew, the vocabulary and construction is the same. Now, I don't have time to untangle all the, all the threads here. Everyone acts badly. But the big problem, the big problem is a lack of faith. God promised to give Abraham a son. But obviously, that wasn't going to happen through Sarah. And so God needed some help. God can't do it, but we can. Let's help him out. That was the attitude. Now, apart from this, the question of whether this was right by Hagar, and apart from the question of whether this was good for Sarah's marriage, and both of those questions might have caused wiser people to not do it, the deepest problem here is a lack of faith. They acted in unbelief, and the result was a mess. And yet, despite their unbelief and bad behavior, God is amazingly gracious. There's some beautiful passages in Genesis where God speaks to Hagar and assures her that he will bless her son Ishmael. In fact, did you know that the only woman in the Old Testament whom God addresses by name is Hagar? And Hagar becomes something of a theologian. She calls God El Roi, which means God who sees because she came to understand that God sees her and cares for her. And yet, the covenant would go through Sarah's son Isaac, whom we will meet in future sermons in this series. But the amazing thing is that no matter how badly Abraham acted, God was faithful. And despite Sarah's unbelief, God kept his promise. This passage can help us sort out a tricky issue in the Christian life. One that especially confronts church leaders. Now, the Sunday that I preach this sermon, we're going to be ordaining four new deacons. Whenever we ordain someone, we are reminded that God gives leaders to his church. God raises up men and women to lead, guide, and protect his church. And the men and women God chooses are a lot like Abraham and Sarah. You know, sometimes we can be role models of faith, and the next minute we are impatient with God. This is a great passage for this occasion because uh, God uses ordinary people, right? And despite our weakness and our brokenness, 
God accomplishes his purposes. We stumble and bumble along, but he is in control and we are under his promise. Now, sometimes we church leaders get impatient with God. And like Sarah, we think that he needs a little help. And so we try to do his work in our own strength and wisdom. Now, this can happen to individual Christians. For example, a Christian young person might be convinced that it is God's will that someday she get married. When she reaches a certain age, she's not married yet. She begins to panic. So she grabs hold of the next guy that comes along and she ignores all the warning signs and marries him anyway. Another example would be the way some Christian parents force their children to make a decision for Christ. Now, every Christian parent wants their children to know Jesus Christ and have eternal life. There's nothing more important to a Christian parent. And so we pray for this. We teach our children. We try to set an example for them. We make sure that they're involved in a church family. We do everything we can. But ultimately, this is between the child and God. And at some point, the faith that we give our children must become their own. And most of us who are Christians have a story about how the faith that was given to us as a child became our faith. So we want that to happen and we do everything we can. A little pressure is not bad. So it's appropriate to make your child take a confirmation class. But sometimes parents will force their children to be confirmed or to be baptized when that is not yet in the child's heart. Now this is an even greater problem for church leaders. This church faces so many challenges today. How do we make disciples of Jesus Christ who have a Christian worldview and can stand up to the world and who go out and make disciples? How do we share the gospel with people who are not interested in Christianity or the church? Now, Obviously, the challenges are great. We know that God wants us to share the good news. We know God wants the church to grow. You don't need a theology degree to know that. So we try to do it. We try to make it happen. And that's not bad. Except when we more or less forget God and try to do it in our own strength and wisdom. So we treat the mission of the church as a problem to be solved, and we apply our best analytical thinking to it, and we develop logical strategies, and we implement those strategies. And sometimes God blesses it, and sometimes he doesn't. Now think of Sarah. The problem is not that she acted. The problem is that she acted in unbelief. We have to act. If you're a Christian parent, you can't say, well, ultimately, my child's faith is between my child and God, so I'm not going to do anything. That is unfaithful. God has appointed Christian parents as a means that he uses. So your part is to do your part 
and trust God to do his part. Likewise with leaders in the church, if we sit back and say, well, God will bring to us anyone he wants to hear the gospel, that's unfaithful. God has told us to share the gospel, to proclaim it. And if we don't do that, we are unfaithful. So just because we don't control the outcome, it's up to God, doesn't excuse us from doing our part. Well, then how do we know what to do? We can't do nothing. That's unfaithful. But we can't act in our own strength and wisdom. So what is the alternative? Well, the alternative and the solution is to seek the Lord and wait on him. We need to seek the Lord and wait on him. What does that mean? Seeking the Lord begins with an attitude of humility. You recognize that your wisdom and your strength are inadequate to do the job God has given you to do. This is a situation Abraham and Sarah were in. Apart from God, they could not have children. This is a situation an individual Christian might be in. You cannot make your marriage work. You cannot bring your child to faith apart from God. This is a situation church leaders are always in. No matter how smart you are, no matter how much money you have, the job God has given you to do is too big for you. And you have to realize that. You can't change hearts and minds. All you can do is surrender yourself the will of God. So seeking the Lord starts with this attitude of humility. And then you prayerfully go to God with whatever the issue is. You say, Lord, you have told us to share the good news. How do we do that in our community? Lord, my child is yours before he is mine. Speak into his life. You pray and you listen. You pray some more and you listen some more. You ponder in your heart and you keep praying and you keep listening until the way becomes clear. That's what it means to seek God. Now, meanwhile, you wait on the Lord. And this can be the hardest thing for most of us to do. It was hard for Sarah. All her life, she had waited to have children and it didn't happen. Now, it was, she thought, too late. God had made promises to Abraham, and Abraham had responded in faith. And yet years had passed. Sarah got impatient with God, and she took matters into her own hands. But what if waiting is necessary for the life of faith? What if waiting makes our faith grow. Now imagine that God put a two-day delivery guarantee on all his promises. He says, I make you a promise, I'm gonna fulfill it right away. Would that make our faith grow? You might think that it would, because if God gives a promise and then bang, it's fulfilled, that seems like it would make us trust God. But actually, I think it would make us arrogant and entitled. We would think that God is a business and we are the customer 
And God better give us what we want when we want it. And would that be good for our faith? I don't think so. Instead, God teaches us to trust him by acting in his time to accomplish his purposes. And by doing this, he teaches us that he is God and we are his creatures. He also teaches us that he is trustworthy and will always keep his promises. Now, waiting on the Lord doesn't mean that you do nothing in the meantime. You're going to be praying. You're going to be seeking. You're going to be relying on the strength of the Lord, and you are going to be acting in faith to the best of your abilities. Trusting him and looking to his strength to do the work he has given you to do. And then you leave the rest to him. If you want to live a life of faith, you must learn to seek the Lord and wait on him. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he gives you certain blessings right away. He gives you a sense of his presence. He lifts your burden of guilt. He gives you joy and peace. And yet there are many promises and many blessings you have to wait for. Christ's return to make all things new, resurrection to eternal life, and that new heart that is completely free from sin and able to love perfectly. God's word of promise, combined with those blessings he has already given us, should convince us that we can trust him to keep all his promises. And our confidence in him enables us to wait patiently.